selfie is everything. Yeah, yeah, man. Okay. We love the energy. How about SMKP Jalan Ipoh? Ipoh! Mana? There we go! Ipoh Pride, Ipoh Pride. Okay. You are few, but you are still got energy. Boleh lah, boleh lah. Boleh lah. Okay, moving on to the next school, SMK Putri Seremban. Tada! It's okay, no worries. They will be coming in shortly, I hope. We hope. Malaysian timing, Malaysian timing. Malaysian timing. Malaysian timing. It's okay, we delay. That means all of you are not Malaysian now. Ah, yeah, you're Singaporean. Okay, moving on to the next school. Who do we have, Gordon? Let's see, um, Suri Bastari Private School. Oh! Oh! oh. Whoa. Whoa. Hey, this one, energy, energy. Y'all want to beat the other school, is it? Can. Can, sorry, bestari, ma. Okay, sorry, bestari, very bestari. Very bestari, very bestari. Very bestari. Very bestari. Next. All right, next up, we have SMK USJ 12. Hey, boy says, eh, tak ada? Alah, tak ada. Okay, it's okay, no worries. It's okay, it's okay. How about Sasana International School? Also, also not here. Do. Okay, at this point, I'm not sure. I'm a little bit worried that they are just not voicing out because they're shy. Uh, maybe lah. So Ayah, no ni shy one lah. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay. Alright, right. moving, moving on. on. SMK Seri Paling. <laughs> Did boleh you hear la, that la. echo, bro? I know, right? The awkward, the, the pin drop <laughs> silence. Hey, your classes got that quiet or not? No lah. This is not yeah. class. Yeah, exactly. How about here 10B International Ipo? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, let's go, 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 let's go. The two girls over there. Shout out. Thank you for making it today. I know the rest of your school missing, but thank you for making it today. Okay, next, Hinhua High School. Oh my gosh, I have not seen the Chinese secondary school uniform in so long. I know, right? It's been so, it's been so many years since we, left, since we left high school. Oh my god, we are so old, man. Old, my my no. back starting to hurt really, you know. Cannot, cannot, cannot. cannot. Okay. Mr. Tongkat, Mr. Tongkat. <laughs> okay, moving on. Oh, announcing the arrival of our VIPs today. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, before we get things started, let us first invite our esteemed VIPs of the day into the hall. Give a round of applause as we welcome our VIPs. Professor Dato Dr. Paul Chan, Chancellor and Co-Founder of Health Education Group, Datin Chan Lau Kam Yok, Co-Founder and Director of Health Education Group, Dr. Go Chi Leung, CEO of Health Tertiary, Professor Kong Kim Hong, Deputy Academic Vice Chancellor of Health University. Accompanied by Dr. Gerard Lewis, Pro Vice Chancellor of Health University, Deans, Heads of Departments, Staff and Student Delegates, and our very special honorable guests for today, Yang Bohomad, Hannah Yo, Minister of Youth and Sports. Thank you so much for joining us today, you may. Uh, please, everyone, uh, please rise for the national anthem. Ladies and gentlemen, you may now be seated. Hadirin hadirat yang dikasih sekalian, sila duduk dan jangan lari ya.
A warm welcome to Help University Site Convention 2023. My name is Gordon. And my name is Ivory. And we're going to be your MCs for today. After a long, long hiatus, Help Psychology Convention and Psychology Challenge is finally back. Bigger and better than ever. And what better way to reintroduce our Hallmark event than by having so many of you from high schools all around Malaysia to join us for a full day of competition and learning. Yeah, Gordon, and truth be told, it's so heartwarming to see so many fresh young minds all gathered here today to experience this one-of-a-kind convention. Truly, you will not get an event like this anywhere else. And let's just say that HELP is home to one of the top psychology programs in the nation. So if you're looking to pursue a career in the field, let's just say you're at the right place. Yes, yes. Come discover what being a psychology student is like. Besides looking at brains all day, you can also learn to be MCs like us. What fun? What fun indeed. Hey, speaking of fun, right, we've got quite a fair bit of fun lined up for all of you today. If I can just uh, pull it up from my phone. Uh, Ivory, what do we have for them today? Well, I heard that there are booths scattered all across the campus, including, you didn't hear this from me, but an escape room. Ooh. Hey, you got two of them, nice. Oh, nice. As well as a whole slew of other games and experiential activities hosted by our own psychology students and graduates. And you can check out all of the details in the booklets that you have in your goodie bags. You can open it up and take a look inside. And of course, while all of this is happening, something else that will be happening is the psychology challenge, which will be happening right here in EMPH in the hall that you are sitting in right now where young and talented future psychologists like yourselves will be fighting it out for the ultimate prize of a full scholarship to pursue psychology here at Help University. Wow, where was this offer when I was going to enroll? We in pandemic, what? Hi. Hi. Anyway, without further ado, let's kick things off with a speech by our very own Dr. Go Chi Leung. He is our beloved CEO of Help Education Services as well as the founding father of Help Psychology Program. Dr. Go, everybody! Good morning, everybody. And welcome to our site convention. It's exciting to have all of you back. As the MCs have said, we've been actually running this event for 20 years. But during the pandemic, for about four or five years now, we've stopped. And it's lovely to see so many people coming from all over Malaysia, not just the Klang Valley, but with people traveling from different states to be here. We are so grateful for all of you to come and share your Saturday with us. I want to start very quickly by thanking a few special people that have made this event possible. Firstly, to our young bro, Humad, YB Hannah Yo, our Minister of Youth and Sports. You know, YB Hannah, I mean, for many years, we know you've been a strong and great supporter of mental health in Malaysia. And you've been a great supporter of psychology and counselling as a profession and of, of us in, in Help International School and Help University. Uh, it's so wonderful to have you grace this event. In fact, you know, there are quite a few of our psychology graduates that have actually gone on to work with you, volunteer in your service centres, and, you know, talking to them, I can say, one of the things all of them say about YB Hannah is this, eh? that you care about people, you love people dearly, and you love Malaysia dearly. It's wonderful to have you here. Let's give YB Hannah a hand. All right? A true friend of psychology, eh? I also like to acknowledge our two founders of Help University. Uh, our Chancellor and Founder, Professor Dato Dr. Paul Chan, our Founder and Director, Datin Chan Lo Kam Yok. Let's give them a hand, all right, and acknowledge them. And I want to say, uh, without two of them, there's no help psychology uh, and probably no psychology in Malaysia because in 99, when I came back from New Zealand and I wrote to everybody, all of the universities saying, hey, let's start psychology. I can tell you nobody was interested because nobody saw a future for psychology at that time. Huh? Nobody talks about psychology in Malaysia. And me people thought, you know, this is not a marketable program. And it was only Professor Datuk Chan and Datin Chan who actually had the vision to see the importance of psychology. And it's because of them we have the largest psychology program in Malaysia and Southeast Asia and 
And I think because of that, many other psychology programs have blossomed. The whole psychology scene has exploded over the last 10 years because of their support and vision. Let's give them a hand again. All right. I also want to thank you know, my colleagues in Help University, our students, all of them who are wearing the black psychology t-shirts, many of them ushered you here today. They've been working around the clock, especially the psychology department, uh, Dr. Victor Goh and Bashir and the psychology team, until late midnight yesterday, <laughs> you know, to, to make this event possible, all right? They've, uh, during a peak period in their semester, worked very hard to make this possible. Let's give them a hand for organizing this event. And I'm sure all of you are going to have a wonderful time. And then you realize how much work has gone into this. Eh? But look, last but most importantly, I want to thank all of the schools for coming. The teachers, the principals, the school students. I know it's not easy coming on a Saturday. Thank you so much for giving up your time. I know you're going to have a great time here. So give a clap for all of you for coming. Eh? All right. So to kick off this event, I'm just going to take five minutes to share a little bit about why we're having this event and the importance of what you're doing today, all right? So first, look, a bit of a history lesson. In 99, we started our psychology program. And over the last, you know, I mean, we started with 30 students, three staff. By 2006, we had 500 students and we had become the largest program in Malaysia. By 2010, we had 1,000 students and became the largest psychology program in the whole of Southeast Asia. And I look back now at all of these fantastic colleagues, academics, lecturers, and students who are not just here but have gone on to do great things all over the world, all right? It's, it's quite an amazing thing. Dr. Victor Goh, who is the head of the psychology department, used to be a student here and graduated, did his PhD, he's come back, he's doing a wonderful job with his team. And 70% of the current lecturers and tutors in that psychology department are our former students. And I think that says something about this department, that we trust in these students, the quality of the program, that we hire our own graduates, and they are doing a wonderful job. They are taking psychology to the next level in Malaysia. And it's amazing. It's an amazing story. In about 2005, we started this convention. At that time, we called it the Psychology Challenge. It was a competition. The idea was to bring all of these schools together, people interested in psychology like you, come together, let's have a competition, you know, give out scholarships. And then about 2011 or 12, it became the Psychology Convention. We had five, 600, maybe up to 1,000 students coming on Saturdays to learn about psychology. It's like a fun fair for psychology. Yeah? You hear talks, you attend booths. So after one day, I can tell you the goal of this is for you to fall in love with psychology, hopefully. <laughs> for you to see that this is a wonderful area, a wonderful field to get into, and something some of you may want to consider in terms of future study. Now, this is really so important. Eh? So this is where I want to share personally. Eh? It's not just a career fair. It's certainly not a marketing event. Eh? We believe in the importance of psychology. Because psychology is about building up the nation, building up the world. And so when we talk about inspiring, hopefully some of you by the end of today, to think of becoming a psychologist or think of studying with us and becoming a psychologist, it's because we believe in the importance of psychology because the wealth of a nation is its people. And when we talk about the future of Malaysia, whether we succeed or not, it's going to depend on the happiness and the health and the quality of its people. And psychology is the science of people, you see? So the wealth of the nation, the most important thing in our future is looking after our people. And psychology is about understanding how people think and feel and behave. And so when I'm here, I'm excited, uh, you know, because we've been doing this for 20 over years and seeing all of these young faces here. Because I'm thinking the next great psychologist is going to be one of you, man. And some of you are going to go on and do great things in Malaysia and in the world as psychologists. And your journey begins here. So I'm thinking back, you know, I reminisce. And I'm thinking back to, you know, many of the great psychologists, sorry, who have actually gone through these halls. People like Esther Goh, who, by the way, is Victor Goh's older sister. <laughs> Dr. Victor Goh's older sister who studied psychology also with us and actually worked in Boston Consulting, right? He's one of the senior leaders in Boston Consulting. 
And, and like many of them in Accenture, Boston, one of the elite consulting firms is doing great work in changing work cultures around Malaysia. You know, I'm thinking of Dr. Ng Siu Lee, who is one of our Fulbright scholars. We had 25 Fulbright scholars. Fulbright scholarship, by the way, yeah, you know, ladies and gentlemen, is a, a special scholarship, full scholarships that are given to top students to study their PhDs in America. We have 25 of them in the last 15 years, you know. The most are by any psychology department in Asia, I can tell you. you know, and Siu Lee is doing amazing work, clinical psychology. Now she's doing work in the area of how do you actually bring communities together. Exactly what we need in Malaysia. I'm reminded of Dr. Ainu Nadira, who did psychology in the same hall as you guys are in right now. She sat in your seats and then went on after graduating from help, went on to do a PhD in Cambridge University in the area of mental health. You know? So today, when I see all of you, I'm excited because I'm thinking, where's the next Dr. Ainu Nadira coming from? And some of you, just like her, started the journey. Just come, not sure what psychology is about. Maybe just following friends, not sure what the event is about. But as you're here, you learn more about this. Hey, maybe you will realise by the end of the day, eh, this is the field for you. So I'm imagining, hey, some of you may end up being clinical psychologists, right? That, that work with mental health, help prevent suicide in Malaysia, help raise the mental wellness in the whole country. Maybe some of you may end up being sports psychologists, Minister of Youth and Sports here. Help us get our first Malaysian Olympic gold medal as a sports psychologist. You know, toughen up our athletes, mental strength, focus, you know, teamwork, all right? Maybe some of you may be hey, helping create world-class organisations in Malaysia by improving work culture, creating a world-class workforce, organisational psychology. Maybe some of you, hey, make our whole nation healthier. Help break addictions to things like alcohol and drugs and smoking. Help us live a fitter life. That's health psychology, by the way. Or some of you may, hey, lead the tech revolution, man. Tech is everything. We just had a tech expo, you know, a, a few months ago. 1,300 students like you are all here. And tech and psychology go together. Google has 500 psychologists working for them. Meta, Facebook, all of these companies because... Things like AI, artificial intelligence, for example, are based on cognitive and neuropsychology models. You know? So a lot of psychologists understanding the way the brain works and things are actually working with IT companies to drive that revolution. Maybe some of you are interested in things like child psychology. Developmental psych uh, is cradle to the grave. Eh? Whether it's infancy or you want to work with young teenagers or garrus psychology working with elderly care, quality of life. For, for people in their late stage of life, very important in an aging population in Malaysia. You know, maybe some of you are in social psychology and uh, Malaysia needs this, uh, bringing communities together. Unity, harmony, that by the way, there's even a psychology of peace that many of you didn't realise, that actually looks at movements. I, I've attended conferences in Europe, psychology of peace, bringing communities together, ending wars. Can you imagine a world where there's no war? A Malaysia where all of us are together, right? Maybe some of you are making Malaysia better by building world-class schools, educational psychology, helping people learn, inclusive education, making learning fun. Wouldn't that be something, right? Creating a happy school environment. Hey, maybe some of you are the next Sherlock Holmes, huh? right? Joining the dots, solving crimes. Hey, I bet you didn't know that. Forensic psychology, you know? Maybe some of you... Nah, Later on, you're going to hear from Dr. Eugene T. He's one of our keynote speakers, you know, and he is in the area of positive psychology. He's going to tell you more about this. But positive psychology is about happiness and joy and fulfillment, you know, and helping people in Malaysia find their meaning and purpose and joy in life. I mean, wouldn't that be a wonderful future for Malaysia? So I'm looking at all of you and I'm excited because I'm wondering, among you here, where are the next great generation of psychologists yeah, that are going to go on and change Malaysia, change the world? So I want to end by saying, we're talking about the future today. Yeah? The future of psychology is here. The future of Malaysia is here. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Goh, for that inspiring speech. Wow. We've all learned a little bit more about... Hello? Test, test? Okay. Oh. Wow. Sound system. 
All right, so we've all learned a little bit more about the field of psychology. So let's move on to our next speaker. She needs no introduction, but we're introducing her anyway. Please welcome to the stage, Yang Bar Hormat, Hannah Yo, Minister of Youth and Sports. Professor Dato Dr. Chan, Dr. Paul Chan, Datin Chan, uh, Dr. Go Chi Leong, Professor Kong, Dr. Gerard, Deans, Head of Departments, Staff and Student Delegates. Thank you so much for inviting me to come and be part of today's event. Um, back in the day, psychology used to be related to mental illness. To some extent, maybe this is still the perception nowadays. But psychology is so much more social, cognitive. I think you have heard the whole list from uh, Dr. Go just now. I just spent the last uh, two days, KBS organized a post-mortem for the SEA Games performance uh, of Malaysia's delegation. And it surprised me how many national sports associations, Persatuan Sukan Kebangsaan, they kept mentioning how sports psychology is crucial. When all the training and preparation is done, sometimes the difference between gold and silver is all in the mind of the athlete. And every time you watch so many of our sports events, you follow it on big screen, whether it's badminton or football, um, you, you, you keep cheering and sometimes they are so near, yet so far. And, and everybody is talking about the road to goal, the first, first goal. And everybody keeps telling me, you know, we've got to help them with our, their mental strength, with their mental strength, uh, help the athletes. And uh, we have um, just helped one key sports association to sign on um, uh, to, to meet a group of psychologists to help our athletes. And so, moving forward, KBS, Ministry of Youth and Sports, through Institute Sukan Negara, is also emphasizing on sports psychology for all our athletes and there are so many career options that can be built on psychology every time a parent comes up to me and asks uh, what do you think is the future what do you think my kids should study and i've been consistent i say psychology because that's really really the the needs of the future um, and my press secretary who is here today rubin Koo, is doing his masters in clinical psychology and there are definitely days when the expertise is helpful in in our office uh, I hope the one million ringgit scholarship that will be made available um, by Help University will be a motivating factor for more students to, ex to explore the field of psychology. Now, the federal government today has launched our theme, the Madani concept, Malaysia Madani. You see that logo in a lot of our posters. The Madani concept under the leadership of Prime Minister Yang Ahmad Bohomad Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim is one rooted in psychology as well. A developed country is no longer made of skyscrapers and trains, but what are in the minds of the people, how we perceive things and how we influence each other. Madani values are sustainability, prosperity, innovation, respect, trust and compassion. You see, when we talk about psychology, we are talking about understanding the engine of our body. When your mind is not healthy, when your mind is unwell, you are not able to work. When a father has mental health issues, he's unable to lead his family and his children, they will also be affected. But when you fix and help the mind, you help not just one person, you help the entire family, their entire organization. And that's why being equipped with the skills to deal with the engine, the most important part of your body, uh, will, will help put you in a place where you are helping to prepare the, the, the leaders of this nation, you know, you and the mind. We deal with so many social problems around Malaysia. And every time you, you, when you dig deep enough, it goes to the, that, that, that mental health uh, of our, our youth. And so, 
we need to raise more psychologies um, because the volume we are unable to cope at this point of time. We, we talk a lot about mental health in parliament. We talk a lot about awareness, telling people, come out, come out and get help and, 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 and get treatment. But when really, that, when the 30% 30, 30 come out, can we, can we cope? Because you know, mental health is not a one-off uh, one treatment, not just one day you can, you can solve the problem. There's a lot of counselling involved. There's a lot of time spent and there's a lot of needs uh, of even the caregiver. So when you, when you study this, I, I, I hope you will take up psychology because this is what we need uh, to, help, to help Malaysia. Okay? Last uh, two weeks, the Prime Minister helped us relaunch Rakan Muda, Nafas Baru. Rakan Muda started in 1994. Um, and back then, I, I was 15 years old. Today, I'm 44. The reason why we have brought Rakan Muda back is because we see there's a great need for our young people to feel a sense of belonging again. Uh, currently, the education sector is quite uh, fragmented. We have different education uh, uh, systems, but we, we need to put everybody together through one platform. And so we believe Rakan Muda will be the tool for unity to help bring people, young people together. So if you are a young person aged 15 to 30 years old, today in Malaysia, you need to be part of Rakan Muda. Um, how do you sign up? You just go to KBS website. You have your handphone now. Can you take out your handphone? kbs.gov.my just key that in, kbs.gov.my, and then you will have a po you, it will take you to our page. There is a Rakan Muda poster. Click on it, and then you just have to look up um, and register which state you belong to. So if you come from Johor, just click on, you know, uh, Johor, and you will see all the Rakan Muda program. We have launched ten Gaya Hidup Baru. Okay, there is something for everybody. You have to choose something that you feel you want to be part of uh, and there will be activities, ongoing activities. And what do you do when you be part of Rakan Muda? You make new friends, friends who have the same interests as you. So for example, you are interested in music, you choose Rakan Music. When you come to a Rakan Music program, you will see people of the same uh, like-minded people. Okay? And you get to do ongoing programs with them. Now, those days, they give you an incentive. If you are part of Rakan Muda, you get a certificate. And they tell you when you graduate from school, if you are part of Rakan Muda, you know, that certificate is very important. But today, um, we have new reward system. Uh, we have worked together with four strategic partners, Food Panda, Grab, Lazada, and Shopee. So they have now become... Uh, strategic partners of Rakan Muda and if you register, you will enjoy rewards when you use Food Panda, Grab, um, Shopee and Lazada. And so I hope you will be part of Rakan Muda. You will get to need, meet uh, old and younger people of your age group um, and together I hope that you know, when you put youth, like-minded youth together through these 10 different lifestyles, um, hopefully it will spark something and it, it will help us rebuild Malaysia strongly. Uh, my challenge today is to get the young people engaged together. Um, if you look on social media today, you will see a lot of um, videos uh, sowing seeds of hatred against other races, other religions. Uh, and this is the kind of battle we have to uh, engage in. Uh, you have to go in there as a young person and help rebuild Malaysia and say this is not the kind of Malaysia we want. Uh, we want a multiracial Malaysia. We want a Malaysia that is inclusive, that respects you know, one another. And so this will not be just the duty of politicians, but it's the duty of everybody. And I really want to thank uh, HELP for uh, investing into this field. One million will definitely help uh, to put some of these deserving students who may not have the money to study this, but they may be, you know, the best psychologists uh, Malaysia needs. And so in, in 20 years' time, 
um, hopefully, out of this one million ringgit scholarship, will come nation builders who will help shape uh, Malaysia. Our young people today, many of them don't know how to handle stress, don't know how to handle comments and criticism online. But this is where my generation may not be able to speak effectively to a person your age. That's why you need to be equipped. You need to have the skill. I remember when I, I studied law and I remember when I graduated, they tell me that in Malaysia back then, in year 2003, they, they were producing about 1,000 new lawyers every year. And I remember going for interview and my boss said this to me. She said, no matter how many lawyers they produce every year, there's always enough room for one more good lawyer. And so I always tell myself, I can be that one more, that just that one more good lawyer. And when I entered politics, I can be that one good politician. So there's enough room. There's enough room in Malaysia for you to flourish. But the difference between a good psychologist and a bad one is the heart. Somebody who really cares about his or her patient. Somebody who wants, really wants to see not just the money that they can earn, but to see the person set free and enjoy life again and will be able... You know, when you have access to a person's mind, you have, you have access to his world, his and her world, her family, her workplace, his uh, organisation and his extended family. So I hope you will take the challenge, go back and, and spread this, uh, share this poster of this one million scholarship because really the power uh, of social media today, only the young people know how to do it effectively. So use TikTok effectively, use TikTok positively to rebuild Malaysia. Okay, there's a lot of negative energy out there, but we, we, we have enough of negative energy. We just need positive energy energy to, to rebuild Malaysia the right way, okay? Viral, likes, all that don't really matter. It matters for today, but tomorrow it doesn't help a family, it doesn't help a person, okay? Invest in yourself, pick up real skills that will help change the engine uh, of our people. So thank you so much and I, I wish you all the best. Uh, all of them are SPM graduates, more or less. For those of you taking SPM, just do your best. If you don't do well, it's not the end of the world. I did not do well in SPM. I'm not saying there are shortcuts in life, but there are other areas where you can excel. Uh, and SPM is not the end. Just remember that. Okay? Thank you so much and all the best. Thank you very much, YB Hanayo, for your wonderful speech. And we, as, and we as a nation, we are thankful to the ministry for all these initiatives which are supercharging the betterment of mental health and psychology as a whole. On to our next speaker, one of the greats of HELP's illustrious history. He has held multiple positions as an academic economic advisor and entrepreneur, as well as one of the founders of the very establishment that you see today. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our Chancellor, Professor Dato Dr. Paul Chan. Morning, YB. You're a great uh, leader to us, and congratulations for your contributions to our beloved nation. We will support you 1,000% in your Rakan Buddha project. Unfortunately, I don't qualify. I'm, I'm 80 years old. <laughs> but all the young students here will support. Do you support? Louder, please. Yes, so you are going to register afterwards. And you have a great leader here to be an example. A person who knows psychology, she practices psychology in a constructive, positive manner to help our country. So there you are, 
we have a great program waiting for you. Now, I learned about psychology in 1963 when I was very young, but I never took up the discipline, probably to my regret. But I want to share you what I know about psychology from a totally different angle. Uh, psychology, and I always ask a question when I interview people and every day to myself. What is the most important project that I ever did in my life? Now and probably for the future. And, and there's only one answer. The most important project is how to live our life, how to manage our lives, nothing else. The rest is just somewhat complementary, supplementary. When we know how to live our lives, we will know how to help other people. So, as far as we are concerned, psychology never gets out of date. You can study accounting, computing, technology, they get out of date. Psychology is eternal. Eternal because it's about human relationship. And the first one is you and you, the relationship inside. And when you understand yourself, you will know how to relate to other human beings and the natural environment and all other ecology around us. So, understanding psychology means knowing how to live well a life that has significance. And that's all, okay? But that means a lot. <laughs> I want you to know that psychology is influenced by some bombastic words like this. <laughs> the first one at the top is ontology. In simple language, it means how we see the world. Some of us see the world as full of difficulties, full of problems, and you're never happy. Other people see the world as one of blessings and opportunities. When we get up in the morning, we are awakened to all the opportunities in life. So ontology is how you see the world around you. Okay? Whether it's north, south, east, west, or the center, or end the center. Epistemology is how do you know that you know or how do you know something that you do not know? This is about the theory of knowledge. The theory of knowledge influences the way we teach and learn and practice psychology. And lastly, another big word, axiology. It means our beliefs, our values. All these three influence the way we look at psychology, which in turn influences our ontology, our epistemology and our axiology. Very simple, very simple, okay? And of course, at TELP, our emphasis would be on the four C's. As you know, your ontology, epistemology and axiology, we know how to develop our character, okay? So in our education here, we focus on character development. Psychology is about character development. But we also cannot ignore leadership. Everyone has some quality of leadership in him or her. So leadership competency is very important. And psychology helps that. The third C is about being a competent professional. And again, you can be a professional psychologist or knowing psychology to become a better accountant, a better computer scientist. So that's the third C, being competent in the profession but assisted by psychology. The last C is about decision making. We make a lot of decisions. They have consequences and this is where YP has been emphasizing the whole morning. The decisions we make have short and long-term consequences on ourselves, on societies, and the world at large. 
So, how to manage consequences can be improved by understanding psychology, okay? Enough has been said by Dr. Go why you should do psychology. I put here 12 reasons, and there's only one reason why you should do psychology. You should not do psychology. You should do help psychology. <laughs> you agree or not? <laughs> Louder. <laughs> yeah, so it's not any psychology, because our psychology is very different, because we have one of the best faculty members in this country, if not in Southeast Asia. So our faculty is very important, but the outcomes are more important. We have produced great achievers, and Dr. Goh has shown you all the achievers, and all of you will be up there four years from now. Put up your hand, all those who want to sign up. <laughs> hey, when is more, all your hands. <laughs> Here, we don't teach you answers. Psychology is about asking very difficult and sometimes funny and strange questions. We always ask why, not just what, not just how. You see, why do you look at life in a particular way? Why do you find heart so relationships so difficult. Why, why, why? Instead of just what and how. Okay, the why is very important. So here we teach you critical inquiry. The most important thing about life and in studies is learning how to question, not learning how to give the right answers because in life there, there are no right answers, okay? There's always shades of grey and, and so on, either, either, not just either or, also and. So, why is put at the top? For example, how do you think about how you think about what you think? But why do you think about how you think about what you think is quite different. You just change the how to why is quite different. And do you think consciously, unconsciously, subconsciously, or non-consciously. Are you conscious now? Yes. Oh, do you feel your chair is very hard? Yes. You feel it? Or very soft? Okay, that's being conscious, self-conscious about the environment. Consider this. How you answer will tell you about yourself. Think about this. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much, Professor Dato, Dr. Paul Chan, for that invigorating speech. Remember, ask the right questions. Take it from us as psychology students. And before we move on to the next segment, we would just like to give a quick shout out to all the students watching at home uh, from uh, CLTG and also from Block H. Thank you so much for tuning in. So now we would like to invite our VIPs onto the stage to open up our official ceremony. All right, so now that our VIPs have their poppers. Sorry, it's just sweetest. Sorry, quick technical difficulties as we figure out how to work the poppers. <laughs> give us some time, give us some time. Okay. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are T minus five seconds to the launch of the 2023 Help University Psych Convention. Countdown with us. Five, 
Please do remain on stage for the picture sessions. Yeah. All right. All right. Right. Okay, thank you once again, Dr. Go, YB, Hannah, Yo, Professor Dato, Dr. Paul Chan, Dr. Gerard Lewis, and Datin for joining us on stage. You may now take your seats. Wow, look at all this confetti. Very colorful. We have color psychology, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right, so first and foremost, booth helpers, you may leave the hall if you are still in the hall. Ladies and gentlemen, say goodbye to any of the booth helpers, but don't worry, you'll be seeing them real soon. Right, so in the meantime, let's give you a very quick idea of what's going to happen now. We're now going to move into three keynote lectures by some of HELP's biggest names that are going to cover the domains of positive psychology, social psychology, and developmental psychology. So do whip out your pens and scribble some notes because for those who are participating in the Psych Challenge, these lectures will help you in the later rounds. And for those who are not challengers this time round, fret not, you are not missing out because all of this is going to be knowledge that you do not find in your usual textbooks. Mm -hmm. So go back, go back to your school, flex to your bio teacher that you learned something new about brain today, yes. Okay, so who do we have for our first lecture, Ivory? All right, I'm quite excited for this one. Um, for our first keynote lecture of the day, we have our very own Dr. Eugene. He's actually authored a couple of books, touching on topics such as mindfulness, the science of feelings, and even one about bromances and biting cute babies. Yeah, I know. That is actually the name of the book. Go read so, it, though. It's actually a good book. Yeah, it is. So, please welcome to the stage, Dr. Eugene. Apologies, let us just set up here for a moment. Okay, all's good. Where do we go? Ah, there we go. So we move forward, yes, there we go. Distinguished guests. Colleagues, friends, students, teachers, mothers, fathers, welcome. A very good morning to you all. I hope you've enjoyed the morning proceedings. My name is Eugene, and I'm here today to share with you really excitedly some of the developments in an area of psychology that you might not have come across before. As Dr. Go has mentioned, this is a sliver, a taster, a preview of an area called positive psychology. The title of my talk today is going to be The Hero Within. I want a little bit of noise. I want a little bit of interaction as I go along. I know you've been suggested to take notes. You don't have to if you don't want to. But I'm going to get you to talk with one another. I hope the title of my talk intrigues you. Because we are going to be celebrating the most important person in the room today, you. 
Today's session is going to be a little bit different from what you might have heard in previous talks, lectures, conversations, seminars, workshops on psychology. Because friends, you all know that psychology is not just about mental illness or mental dysfunctions. We got to also focus on what is right with us. We need to start asking a different question rather than to say, hey, what's wrong with you today? I'm going to ask you to change the tune of that question. That conversation is going to take a slightly more positive spin as you start asking, reflecting about what is already right with you. And so today's keynote, my short time here with you today, is going to be about character strengths, the goodness, the virtues that already lie within you. When is or when was the last time someone asked you, hey, this is something really good with you. I really like how creative you are. I really like how humorous you are. You bring a lot of humor. You, you, you're a really great joke teller. I like how loving and caring you are. I like how compassionate you are. When was the last time you had such conversations? Psychology isn't just the study of mental illness. We need to change the tune to start talking about well-being, happiness, joy, and the reasons for making our lives worth living every single moment of the day. I want you to think about and hold this in mind. Your strengths are kind of like your superpower. And we're going to make the connections here to some really familiar characters as we go along. So just to give you a quick preview of what we'll be covering today, let's address the negativity in the room first and all the questions that we've been used to asking about ourselves. What's wrong with you? I promise this is as much pessimism as you'll get in the day. We're going to transition very quickly to a conversation about strengths and the heroes that we can actually learn this wisdom, this language of strengths from. And I'll leave you with a challenge. Some of you who are taking part in the psych convention, the psych challenge, the quiz that's going to be taking place after this, right? To remind yourself that you are here for a very, very good reason and you can overcome your challenges. Let's start off first. Slightly pessimistic note, but there's a point to this. You might have been asked this question, you might have thought this to yourself, but the question that we often find and realize that's occupying our thoughts is, what's wrong with you? Why are you not feeling well today? Why the moody face? Why the sour face? These are not pleasant questions to ask, but these are our most commonly held thoughts and beliefs, and they occupy us throughout the entire day. You only need to hop on, those of you who are listening to YB Hannah's talk, you only need to hop onto social media to start realizing that unkind words are being shared left, right, center. It's very difficult to get out of this frame of mind of thinking just about the negatives. And so as I go through this very quickly, just think to yourself, you know, I could very easily complete these question prompts, these sentences. You should be more, I could be more intelligent, I could be kinder, I'm too sensitive. I could be, well, I wish I was taller. I wish I was fitter. Why didn't you score higher on exam? Careless mistakes again, right? Focusing on the mistakes. You made the same mistake, you were careless. I mean, we judge ourselves really, really critically. We are our own worst critics. Why can't you be more, oh, you've heard this before, haven't you? Can't be more like the student, can't be more like your sister, can't be more like your brother. Why can't you just be more? If you don't fix this, this is going to be a problem in the long run. Other questions, you need to improve a lot of fixation on the deficits, a lot of focus on the negatives. These are surely unpleasant things to hear. I ask the same question over and over, time and time again. And for those of you with smartphones, you might want to grab a picture of this. On the next slide, you will find a reminder a very strong reminder, a very important reminder that that is not the full story of who you are. Your full self, your whole self has got to include the positives, your strengths, your virtues, your talents, things within yourself, characteristics within yourself that are already good, authentic, and true to the best of who you are as an individual. Weaknesses, criticisms don't define you. They should not define all of who you are and who you wish to become. These criticisms, however, still, they stay in our minds, they are persistent, 
on the next slide, here's a word cloud. When I ask the same question, and I keep repeating this question because it tells us so much about our negativity bias. Yes, we have to fix our limitations. Yes, we have to fix our weaknesses. But that shouldn't only be the topic of our conversation. I asked a group of students, not unlike you, what don't you like about yourself? And so the word cloud you see on the slide here is essentially from a whole chunk of about 100 students to say, well, I'm, 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 I overthink a lot, right? I am not intelligent enough. I'm not tall enough. I'm too sensitive. I'm too introverted. I'm too shy. I'm not like my friend who's the life of the party. But friends, there are only two words that stand out for me that really summarizes this entire word cloud. And it's a constant reminder of our deficits and our limitations. The two words there are just simply uh, saying to ourselves that we are not enough. I think it is time we change that conversation. And I want to invite you to start learning and using much more frequently the language of strengths. Raise your hand, those of you who are familiar with heroes, superheroes, you've seen some in the movies. Raise your hands. You remember, if I mention who Spider-Man, Iron Man is, you remember who they are. Great, thank you. Marvel fans in the audience, this is a treat for you. We are going to learn about psychology, the language of strengths, from the heroes that you're most familiar with. Character strengths are essentially reminders of the goodness within us. We inspire, we are, as, we are inspired to be like the heroes we see on the silver screen. We admire their tenacity, their courage, their perseverance. And so, these are all also indirectly reminders of the goodness that already resides within us. Would you believe me if I told you that this was an area of study in psychology? You might have come here today with a recognition or maybe an understanding that psychology is about mental illness, it's about treating depression, it's about managing stress and helping people overcome anxieties. That's one part of the psychology story. A study of the human condition is not complete until we also understand what works well and what are the factors that lead us to a life of thriving. Over to you, I want to hear some chatter. I want to hear you making noise. I want you to start guessing which Marvel superhero said this. And I'm just going to read it out. I'll give you five seconds to guess. Make some noise, my friends. No man can win. No man or woman can win without a battle. But no man or woman should fall without a struggle, without trying. Any guesses? The answer in five, four, three. Guesses. Very good. The gentleman has got that right. Your Marvel fan, Spider-Man, from Spider-Man Homecoming. There is research on this, my friend, because when we examine the research on perseverance, we find that beyond IQ, beyond your baseline hardworkingness and diligence, you succeed just by virtue of your true grit alone. You're going well. If this was a quiz, you have one out of six marks so far. Next, courage, bravery. At some point, you have to decide, we all have to decide between what the world wants and who you are, or what the world wants you to be and who you are. Any guesses, answers in five, four, three, two, one. Any Black Widow fans in the audience? There is a psychology of courage, and what the research tells us is that courageous individuals stand their ground you need to be courageous to say the right thing when everyone else is saying something else. Hope is a strength. How many of you are hopeful individuals here? You know that there is a way forward, past through the difficulties, the struggles, and the challenges that you are facing. Here's your quote. You think life takes more than it gives, but not today. Today, it's giving us something. Hope gives us a chance. Life is giving us a chance. Any guesses? Also a Marvel character. Five. I thought I heard the answer. I'm going to go straight ahead. That was five seconds. Maybe not everyone's favorite character, but that was Star-Lord. Friends, hope is not wishful thinking. When we think about the will and the way to succeed, we can cultivate hope. Some of you are naturally more hopeful than others. The next quote, you would think forgiveness, really? Forgiveness is a strength? It's not just courage. It's not just ambition. Only a strong forgive. Guess where this quote comes from? 
Vengeance has consumed you. It's consuming them. I am done letting it consume me. Oh, very good. I heard the answer. You guys are making, it, making me look bad in front of, of the entire audience here. You're making it too easy to say, you are right. Chadwick Boseman, God bless his soul. That is a quote from Black Panther. There is psychological research on forgiveness that tells us that it's not only good for health, it's good for our relationships as well. Fifth, another quiet strength, humility. It's not a strength you can claim for yourself. You guys are really enjoying this. I might just, just skip through, right? Because you got it right. I would rather be a good man than a good king. Thor from Thor, the dark world. And you know what? Again, there is research. Ask me about it. There's research on humility. And if you're here today, you already exemplify that strength to all of us here. Why? I want to learn. I am curious. I want to know what the site convention event is about. I want to know maybe a thing or two more about psychology. Maybe this is something I take on board as an area of study. That is a specific form of humility called intellectual humility. I, I skip forward because you guys are doing so well already. You guys remember, not a hero, but the ability to regulate your own needs, your own wants, to delay gratification, self-perseverance is also a strength. You guys recognize this character, yes? Maybe not necessarily a hero, but if you can hold your desires, your wants, and your wishes, if you don't succumb to the lure of TikTok in the midst of you doing your homework, that is a strength. That is self-regulation in action. Last one, okay, love. Love is a strength. There is a psychology of love. There is a body of research looking into love. Relationships make or break us. Any guesses? This one's a little bit tougher. Thor, Thor doesn't appear twice, but good guess. Ant-Man, someone from Ant-Man, yes. It's, who is it? Not Ant-Man, but I'm just gonna reveal a question. The, uh, well, if you said Ant-Man, you are right. The original Ant-Man said that, all right? So you can read the code off the screen, right? But essentially, we're looking into love as really the essence of meaningful relationships. And the research tells us that as well. Folks, I hope I've gotten you excited to think about psychology beyond mental health, beyond depression, stress, worries, concerns, deficits, weaknesses. The new science of positive psychology speaks to this new language of strengths. It's a language that I think we need to adopt in moving forward, in recognizing the best of who we are and what we can offer. Positive psychology is the study of optimal human functioning. That's a very technical definition. If you take one thing away, let me just rephrase that and say, if you study positive psychology, you are studying what is right about human beings. You are studying what works well for them. You are studying the virtues, the values that has brought us as an entire human race this far into our history. Positive psychology encompasses a broad area, a broad spectrum from positive emotions, how engaged you are at work. Why do people want to come to work? Sounds strange, isn't it? Again, the narrative is, I don't want to go to work. I'm dreading Monday mornings. But what can people who want to go to work on Monday mornings, what can they tell us about what's right? Positive psychology also looks into relationships. You heard our illustrious founder also mention, it's got something to do with meaning as well. Positive psychology speaks to questions about what makes life worth living. Achievements, goal setting, meeting your goals, living up to the best of your potential. Those are also topics of study within the domain of positive psychology. The quotes you saw there, they are all areas of study within this particularly interesting developing area of psychology. As we slowly wind down, one final activity that I'd like you to do right now, you're probably seated next to someone who knows you, someone who is familiar to you. Go ahead and grab a picture. I love the slide, colorful slide, right? And I want you to turn to the other person and say, hey, I see this in you. I see this strength in you. You're a loving person. You're a grateful person. You're a hopeful person. You're a creative person. I love your sense of humor. You're someone who appreciates beauty and excellence. 
It's a different spin, isn't it? We need to, once again, I hate to sound like a broken record, but move away from a fixation on our limitations and our weaknesses. Go ahead, I'm gonna skip ahead to the slide. I don't wanna eat up too much of the next speaker's time, but the research is that the research is sound, it's solid, ongoing research repeatedly tells us again, the more we play to our strengths, the more we focus on what already works well within us, we enjoy better success academically. We report higher levels of life satisfaction. And you know why? Because strengths are essentially who we are. There's nothing that needs to be changed. We just need to shift the lens a little bit towards focusing on what already works with us. Start from a place where you find yourself capable. You are confident about who you are. People who use their strengths report higher levels of life satisfaction they also perform better in the workplace as well. So a call to action here to get you to recognize your strengths. If you'd like to, I'll be happy to continue this conversation with you as we discuss further ways to further identify your strengths. There's a website that you can go to to understand your strengths further, all right? But think also about how you can use your strengths to benefit those around you. Your strengths are only gonna go so far as to benefiting yourself if you only ever think about yourself. Like the superheroes you saw earlier, we can use our strengths for the greater good. Think about the life story you want to tell, think about your heroes, and think about, as you reflect upon the Marvel superheroes or any other characters from Harry Potter, Star Wars, who do you wish to be more like? Maybe it's not their powers or their magical abilities that make them who they are, but it's something, a reflection of the character that inspires you to be the best of yourself. Our key takeaways for today, recognize that we start from, and we've tended to, psychology is also partly to be blamed for this, a fixation on the negative. Fixing, addressing, healing the broken. And what's not working well for us? We need to change that tone. We need to change the language to focus also on what is working well within us. Focus on our strengths. There are 24 character strengths, the combination of which are unique to you. No two individuals are ever likely. You're not gonna meet someone with the same set of strengths, not in that order. You might be creative, you might be humble, and you have a good sense of humor. Very few people have those three in the same arrangement as you do. So once again, I thank you for your attention. I will end with one final quote. And again, this is from a Marvel character. We are all gonna fail about if we try to be what the world wants us to be. We're gonna fail if we're forced into believing that what others tell us is the way that we should live our lives. We have failed, and we have failed repeatedly when we try to be who others think of us to be. We fail at who they're supposed to be. So just to read off the quote, the measure of a person, the measure of a hero, measure of who you want to be as an individual is really, it boils right down to who you are truly yourself. Last three things I will say before I close my speech, and this was told to me and it still resonates with me until this very day. My friends, you belong here. What you do matters. Third, last but not least, certainly, recognize and celebrate your strengths. Thank you very much. Have a great day ahead. I'm wiping tears from my eyes, not gonna lie. Thank you very much, Dr. Eugene. A little positivity in the morning, mo motivation in the morning, good start to the day. And from our audience as well, thank you. I love the energy, love the interactions. But first, but first I need you all now to be si too silent. Your phones, I'm trying to silent your phones, relax. <laughs> Just need you all to silent your phones, okay? Just a quick reminder. All right, so next, introducing to the stage is Dr. Andy Musra, a senior lecturer here in HELP who hails from our neighboring country of Indonesia. Today, he'll be talking to us about developmental psychology so we can all learn a little bit more about how we've developed into the people that we are today. Please give a round of applause for Dr. Andy. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. He's already here.
All right, good morning, everyone. Good. Thank you for inviting me here. So today, we're going to look at this creature butterfly. Beautiful, isn't it? But have you ever stopped and considered how it came to be? You know this creature was once a crawling caterpillar, limited its mobility and perspective. Yet through a process, it transformed into something stunning, something that now can fly and see the world from entirely different perspective. Our development, much like the butterflies, it's marked by great changes, okay? So, but how does this journey unfold in human? How does this journey transform? How does human transformation occur? To answer these questions, in psychology, we study what is called as developmental psychology, which sounds a bit fancy, but really it's just about how and why we change as we age. But it's not just about physical changes, like shooting up taller or sprouting a mustache. It's also about emotions, feelings, and how we see the world around us, which I think is pretty cool. So because all of you are teenagers, I mean most of you are teenagers, I'm going to focus on your development or how and why you change as you age right now. So this phase, also known as adolescence, is where the major changes appear from being a child to being an adult. So there are four major ha changes happen during these teenage years. First is physical changes where you realize your body start to grow bigger and taller, or you might start to use deodorant because your armpits smell funny. And then emotional changes. Because your brain changed during this time, you might start feeling emotion more deeply, or even not wanting to share your emotion at all, which can lead you to feel lonely. And then social changes. We start to have closer friends, best friend forever, BFF, or maybe even liking someone and wanting to go on a date with. During this time, hanging out with friends become more priority. And finally, cognitive changes. So as a teenager, the way we think things is different. We're starting to ask questions like why and how. Why do I need to follow rules? How can I win this competition? And we start to question and decide whether what we believe is right or wrong. So all these changes happen so suddenly and abruptly. One moment in life is like, boom. Why am I here? How did I end up in this situation? Like getting bigger, taller, and my voice change. Well, we have one culprit to blame, and that is our brain. So during teenager, your brain sends signals to your body to start its changes. Okay? So you might notice these changes like physical changes. So in physical changes, the brain starts sending signals using special substance called hormones, which lead to growth and sexual development. Emotional changes. The brain changes and matures during puberty, which make you feel emotion more deeply, like getting sad easily or getting angry easily. I was an angry teenager myself. I used to slam the door or having a tantrum whenever I have argument with my mom, which I'm not proud of because I cannot control it. I was just a teenager. And then you have social changes. You know, when you start having attention or get compliment, your brain actually releases a hormone that makes you feel good whenever you get attention from someone. That's why you prefer opinion from your friends and hanging out with your friends much more important 
And that's why you wear makeup. Well, not all of you, some of you. And then finally, cognitive changes. As a teenager, your brain gets better at making decisions. It's like your brain leveling up during teenager. It's like in a video game, your brain leveling up, get smarter and better as you grow, and upgrading new skills. So before we cast further blame on the brain, let's get to know it first. So this is a simplified map of the brain. Each part of the brain serves different functions. Like the red one, the frontal lobe. This is where the magic happens during our adolescence. It's important for problem solving, decision making, planning, thinking. The blue one, parietal lobe, it's important to process sensory information that is received from outside of the world, like sensory, touch, temperature, and taste. Or the green one, the occipital lobe. This is important for everything that we see, okay? Everything about vision. And then going to the lower part, the temporal lobe, the purple one, it's important for anything that we listen, like hearing, and even feeling emotions. And then finally, we have cerebellum and brainstem. These parts of the brains are important for basic functions like balance, coordination, heart rate, blood pressure. So you see, our brain is a complex organ where each part of the brain works together to help us navigate the world. But during adolescence, this brain is working over time, working over time to develop and define its functions. But here comes the bad news. As a teenager, your brain is not fully developed yet. So you guys pretty much, sorry, sucks at everything. You're still trying to figure out everything pretty much. While your bodies might grow rapidly, bigger and taller, your brains pretty much still work in progress. In fact, scientists believe that our brains still continue to develop and grow well into our mid-20s. So imagine you are like in a marathon. You are in the middle of the race. You're not at the starting line no more, nor the finish line. So next time you feel like making mistakes or feel overwhelmed by your emotion, it's not just because you're just a teenager. It's because your brain is still developing and growing. But any, like any good marathon, it's not about how fast we reach the finish line. It's about the journey that we experience and what we learn along the way. You see, as a teenager, we are so drawn to take chances and new experiences. We push limits test boundaries, disobey our parents, and yes, break rules. When I was in high school, I almost got raped out because I skipped classes. Whenever there is a new movie being released, I will go to watch the movie during the day. But the question is, why, do I, why did I do that? Why as a teenager we take risks? make a mistakes. And the question lies here, the brain. But for now, let's take note of this. Taking risks is not all about bad things. It's also about self-discovery, about understanding ourselves and the world. So take a risk, but just make sure that you don't take a risk that will cause me to lose my job, like jumping on top of the rope, okay? So this is not a recommendation. So taking risks actually has something to do with emotion, especially feeling the emotion versus controlling the emotions. So if you ever watch Star Trek, imagine like a battle between two main characters, Captain Kirk 
and spoke. So, the prefrontal cortex, which represents by spoke, and the limbic system, which represents by Captain Kirk, is in the battle. So here we have Captain Kirk, which represents the limbic system. This part of the brain, much like Captain Kirk, loves to have fun, follow impulses, do whatever it likes. It doesn't think about consequences. It just wants to have fun. It pushes you to try new cool things. But luckily, we have Spook, which represents the prefrontal cortex. Much like Spook, which is calm and logical, this part of the brain helps you make decisions. It plans for the future and always think about what next. But during our teenage years, this inner spook of yours is still learning, is still developing. So that's why sometimes you are a bit slow in making right decisions. But don't worry about it, because as you grow up, your inner spook will get better at helping you make smart choices. So in other words, the part of the brain that feeling the emotion or want to have fun develop much faster than the part of the brain that controlling our actions, making it hard for teenagers to follow the rules. That's why you pass your own night curfew, not listening to your parents, and do all those fun and stupid things. But it's not all about negative things, you know, as a teenager. It's also about immense possibilities. As a teenager, your brain is like Play-Doh right now. You can shape it whatever you want it to be, okay? And as a teenager, we have lots of energy, right? Channel your energy to shape the brain. Use your energy to learn second or third language, play new instrument, pick up new sports, or whatever you want to be. Because during this time, your brain is like a sponge that can absorb anything easily. So the brain during adolescence is really like a door of opportunity. Whatever you want it to be, it will be. But just like being careful, on inviting someone to your house, you also need to be careful in putting something in your brain. When you fill your brain with something good, it will get used to with something positive. But if you fill your brain with something negative, it will get used to with something negative. So now I'm gonna tell you a little secret that not everyone knows, well, except those who has taken psychology. So there's something called neuroplasticity. It sounds a bit sciencey, right? It sounds a bit mouthful, neuroplasticity. So what is neuroplasticity? Neuroplasticity is the capacity of our brain to change and grow, OK? It's our brain superpower. It's what allows us to learn new things adapt to new situations, and even recover from injuries. So during this time, imagine your brain like a bustling city. But as a teenager, your brain city is still under rapid construction. So new buildings, which represent your knowledge, information, is being laid down constantly, a new connection is being laid down and being built up. For, for instance, let's say you want to play guitar, right? When you learn to play guitar for the first time, you suck at it, you're not good at it, right? But the more you practice, the more you learn, your brain actually build connections between the brain. And the more you practice, the connection gets stronger. That's why as you learn, as you practice more, it's getting easier and easier to play the guitar. 
So let's see here. We have adult brain and we have teenage brain. The adult brain has already been built up. It's so crowded. In other words, the neuroplasticity here is slows down. As compared to teenage brain, the teenage brain is not fully developed yet. So you can put anything, you can learn anything easily. You can build a new buildings. But how to have a better brain? That's the question, right? How can we have a better brain? How to optimize this superpower? Well, we can do something cliche called shell. S stands for sleep. Now, who doesn't like to sleep, right? But when we sleep, we think it's just about for our body, you know, getting bigger and stronger. But actually, when you sleep, your brain is cleaning up something inside your brain. It reorganizes information that you learn during the day. It's like siding up your room so you can see things much clearly. That's why after you have enough sleep, you remember things much easily the next day. And then we have H stands for healthy eating. So your brain's much like a luxury car. You wouldn't fuel it with cheap fuel, right? Imagine it's a Lamborghini. You will fill it with something good, like fruits, vegetables, whole grains. So give it a Lamborghini treatment it deserves. And E stands for exercise. When we exercise, we think that we're just doing for our body getting stronger, getting bigger muscle. But actually, when you exercise, especially when you do cardio, there is a part of your brain that is important for memory. It's getting bigger, which is called hippocampus. So when you run every day, when you exercise every day, this part of the brain that is important for remembering getting better. So that's why successful people, they go to the gym and they exercise. And finally, L stands for learning new experience. I said it once and I said it again. Your brain during teenager is like a super sponge that can absorb anything. So learn everything. Learn to play guitar, learn new instruments, join sports, dive into a new book, or whatever you want it to be. Okay, so as we finish up talking about growing up and how underdeveloped your brains are, think about teenager as a, being a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. Right now, you are a caterpillar inside of the cocoon. But one day, you will transform into a beautiful butterfly that you're meant to be. So we learn one thing today, is that as a teenager, we tend to take more risk. That is because the part of the brain that control our actions and emotions is still developing. But taking risks is not always a negative thing, like I say. It can help you to develop yourself, understand the world around you. We also learn that our brain does pretty cool things called neuroplasticity. As a youngster, you are at the peak when your brain can very flexible absorb any information. So at the moment, you are at the big jump. It's all about becoming your own individual. So embrace all these changes open to new experiences. So one day, you'll become your own special butterfly. Whether you become an A-star student, athletes, artists, musicians, psychologists, astronauts, or whatever you want to be. So I encourage you to go out there, not now, to go outside and learn a lot of things. Take a risk. 
you can start taking risks by getting to know other students from different schools. Okay? So here's for being a teenager. Have fun and take risks. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Andy, for your insightful dive into developmental psychology. Right, on to our next speaker, who will be talking about social psychology and why humans behave the way they do. He holds a master's in cognitive neuroscience and a PhD in sports, health, and exercise sciences. Give it up for our resident neurosports psychologist, the very manly, Dr. Harry Manley. Okay, super, I think we're there. Good morning, I know you've been sat down for a very long time already. Um, my name is Dr. Harry Manley. I'm gonna talk about some work that we've done on, um, on the social perception of faces. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna focus on um, kind of three key topics here. One is gonna be how good are we at recognizing faces? Uh, the other one is, is there anything special about the way that we process faces that's distinct from how we process objects? Um, and then what sorts of judgments do we end up making about other people based on, on their faces? So to begin, I'm gonna show you uh, a little clip here, and it's a, a reconstruction of a crime. It's low resolution, it's, it's a bit grainy, um, but you're gonna witness somebody doing something suspicious. And what I want you to do is just see if you can identify uh, the suspect that's here. Okay, so it's low resolution, but you've got a couple of good glimpses of the person's face there. Um, and I want you to imagine that the person there was, was doing something suspicious in this ventilation shaft. Um, do you think you could identify uh, the suspect? So I'm going to show you now uh, a lineup with six possible suspects. Uh, notice the, the hairstyle of the individual that was there has changed uh, in this lineup. But have a look at the next six people that you see um, and see if you can pick them out. Okay, just for now, try and come to your own decision before you chat to any of your neighbors. What I want you to think of, first of all, is how confident are you, irrespective of who you've just chosen, how confident are you in your selection? And I want you to think, just on a scale, of going from like zero would be, I have no clue, absolutely no idea who it is, 50 would be, yeah, I'm sort of sure, and 100 is I'm 100% certain who it is, think where you fall along that scale, um, and just remember that number, remember that level of confidence. And then just for the next 10 seconds, uh, just chat to your neighbor, see who they thought it was, see if you agree.
Okay. So we're going to come back to this at the end. I want you to remember the number that you've picked, uh, and I'll tell you who the, the suspect was later. We're going to start with a simple exercise here. I want you to look at this image and, and think about how do you end up directing your attention here. And if you're like most people, uh, your attention is going to be mainly drawn to the face. Your eyes tend to just linger a, a lot longer on the face than any other object here, such as the, the cup or, or the table. And this tendency to focus on the face is a sort of evolutionarily adaptive strategy. So it provides us a lot of information looking at the face. And these are things that we do without having any conscious awareness of it. And within a, a fraction of a second, we end up using information about the facial features uh, to determine the person's age. Uh, you infer their health, their, their gender. We decode their facial expression. So you see the fact that she's smiling, and then you use that to make further inferences that she's probably in a, a happy emotional state. And then we go further to even gauge uh, aspects about her personality. So we think that maybe she's sort of trustworthy and, and competent or, or whatever personality characteristics that you might think. And we do all of this in a, a fraction of a second. And then within the face, do you notice where your eyes tend to linger the longest? So most likely, it's around the region of the, the eyes and the mouth. And again, this is because it's the areas that we tend to, to decode emotions. We recognize uh, faces. We identify who the person is. You find that the lips provide a, a huge amount of, of information to us. So most of you are probably, when you look at me, uh, you're looking at my lips as they move to try and help you understand what, what is this guy with a British accent uh, actually talking about. Um, the eyes as well provide a huge amount of, of information. So where somebody is looking indicates where their attention is directed. And we often follow people's gaze automatically. So a lot of this stuff happening. Um, and this kind of brings us to a, a question that I'm interested in here is whether we end up processing faces the same way that we process objects. And as a, a bit of a spoiler, the answer turns out that not really. There, there tends to be some important differences here. So to understand one way that they differ, we're going to travel back in time to uh, the, imagine it's the early 1990s, um, and that you're a participant in a study that was done by James Tanaka and Martha Farah. And in this study, participants were learning to identify six faces and the respective houses of these individuals. And they chose houses because they're meant to be sort of equal complexity and variety as the, the faces. So imagine in a learning phase that you're shown somebody's face and you're told that this is Lisa. Uh, and then you're also told that this is Lisa's house. And in the original study, the, the stimuli was much more sort of impoverished than this. Um, so you learn these six faces, six houses. And then in the testing phase, participants were shown either the whole face or, uh, so the whole face or the whole house or a part of the house, like the eyes from the face uh, or maybe the, the windows uh, from the house. Now here's the critical question. If we end up processing faces and houses in fundamentally the same way, what would you expect to find? So I think you would predict that it would be tougher to recognize people in the part condition as opposed to the sort of whole condition. But crucially here, the idea is that if our brains are treating faces and houses in essentially the, the same way, our ability to recognize them should be equally affected by whether we see them as the whole or as parts. And if we look at uh, what happened, so for houses, it turns out that participants could identify them just as well when you were given the whole house or just a part of the house. There's a little bit of a quirk in this data that they actually do slightly better in the part condition, but I, I want you to ignore that because I think it's just noise. However, with faces, it was a different story. So participants were much better at recognizing faces when they saw the entire face as opposed to when they're given uh, just a part of it. 
And what this suggests is that we process faces in fundamentally kind of more holistic way. So we need to see the entire face, uh, how all the different parts of it come together in order to accurately recognize someone. So that's one of the things that, that makes face perception special. We're going to do another little experiment here. So if you look at the faces, and I want you just to focus on the top halves of the faces. So there's a little white line that intersects uh, horizontally at the, the midpoint here. Focus on the top halves only, and think to yourself whether they are all the exact identical same top halves of the faces, or whether there's any differences here. So put your hand up if you think that maybe one of those people is a little bit different. Does anyone think they're different? And no cheating and putting your hands across and uh, splitting up. Uh, who thinks that they are all exactly the same person? Okay, it feels like about a 50-50 split on that. Um, so these are different. Um, no, they're not. They're the same. It's the exact same identical person that's being presented uh, at the top here. But because we have different faces at the bottom, what people tend to do is integrate this information from the different bottom faces, and it gives you a sort of perceptually different experience uh, of the top part of the face that you're looking at here. And this is something known as the, the composite face effect. And it's interesting that we don't experience this with non-face objects. So again, suggesting that there is something about uh, the sort of face perception that, that is unique and, and special in the way that we process uh, the whole information. And if you want to see uh, those top halves looking the same, you can see them just there. Another insight into how we process faces in a, a sort of special way comes from when we look at upside down faces. So I want you to think to yourself, um, how good do you think you are at face perception? If I was to give you an upside down face, um, compared to when it's in an upright position, do you think your face perception would be just as accurate and as fast, just as accurate but a little bit slower, or far less accurate and far slower? I'm going to give you another spoiler that the answer to this question is the last one, C. So again, without cheating and, and tilting your head here, um, see if you can tell who this person is. And I imagine a, a few of you might be able to guess who it is. Um, that's not the thing I'm interested in here. What I'm interested in is when you look at this image, does anything seem weird or off to you? And I would suggest that for those of you that haven't tilted your head or, or seen this image before, nothing really does pop out that strongly. It, it doesn't look like there's anything strange going on. But if we spin her upright and see what you're just looking at. So for those of you that know, it, yeah, this was Adele. Um, but not as you know her, so the eyes and the mouth have been inverted. Um, but we don't tend to notice that too easily. Another example here, you can probably pick out, this is a, a young woman, smiling, she's blonde hair, she's wearing glasses. But everything else looks relatively normal. And if we flip her around, <laughs> again, we'll find out she is anything but normal. So you've got these pretty sort of ghastly mouth and, and eyes here. And this effect is something known as the Thatcher illusion. So this is named after the fact that the original stimuli uh, was based on an ex-prime minister from the UK called Margaret Thatcher. Uh, the less said about her, the better. And these findings here suggest that our brain is kind of specifically wired to recognize upright faces. So in the case of the, the Thatcher illusion, um, why don't we notice those oddly placed eyes and mouth? Um, well, the, the argument here is that basically we can engage in two different sorts of processing. And the default one that we use when we're looking at faces is to engage in some sort of configural processing. So we look at the overall configural layout of the different parts and features of the faces, um, and it's this configuration that we then map on to sort of stored internal models that we have of faces. Um, 
And we can also engage in an individual level. So we can inspect uh, the nose, the eyes, the mouth, and, and so on. Um, and despite the kind of configure approach being our, our default one, our brain just doesn't store internal models of upside down faces. So when we're trying to, to look at this face, if we can't process it in a configurable way, we resort to just looking and focusing on the individual features here, so the little parts. And in this case, when you look at the mouth, everything looks normal, it looks okay. And similarly, when you look at the eyes, nothing looks wrong. Um, but we need the face to be upright in order to uh, really pick out and notice those differences. Now, I'm gonna move on to a slightly different topic here. Um, and something that's been a, a sort of very well studied but still controversial area um, is whether there is a, a particular region in the brain that is specialized for processing uh, faces. And this is, in many ways, a sort of controversial idea because if you think about, um, imagine you were like designing a visual system for how the brain would process, process visual stimuli, what would make sense is that you would design one single general purpose visual system that processes everything, and faces would just be like one of, it might be a more complex example, but it'd be one of many different visual inputs. But when we look at the evidence, uh, a lot of it seems to be in favor of the argument that, do you know what, there is actually a, a particular region that seems to be specialized for, for face perception. And some of the evidence for this comes from if you do recordings um, in primates, so if you take a, a very, very thin electrode and insert it into the brain of a primate, and you can go down to a region called the superior temporal sulcus, and you insert this electrode, and you can record the activity of individual neurons, so cells in this region, um, and you find cells that are selectively active for the presentation of faces. So we've got an example of two cells here and their firing rates. Uh, so basically how excited they get when different stimuli is presented to them. Um, and you can see here for these two cells, uh, they're very active whenever they get presented the stimuli of the, the monkey faces or similarly a human face. But when you present non-face objects, patterns and overlapping objects, uh, there's not much activity that, that comes from this region. We also get a lot of converging evidence in humans. Uh, so if you use something known as functional magnetic resonance imaging, uh, so this is a, a tool that will allow you um, to basically look at the oxygenation or the change in uh, oxygenation of blood in particular regions of the brain, and you can use that signal to then infer which regions of the brain were being active during a, a task. You find if you present stimuli such as faces, um, and objects, there's a region of the brain called the fusiform face area that will be selectively active for faces, uh, but not for other complex visual stimuli uh, such as objects. It was named, the, the, the region got its name after finding out that it was active for, for faces rather than being called that in advance. And then lastly, if our brain processes faces differently to how it processes objects, you might expect to find specific disorders that uh, affect face recognition. And this is evident in a condition called prosopagnosia, or more commonly termed face blindness. And this affects an individual's ability to recognize faces while still having intact uh, object recognition. So in other words, and this point is really important, like your visual system is absolutely fine, you have intact ability to recognize uh, shapes and, and patterns, um, but it's just the, the particular systems that are responsible for processing faces that seem to be impaired. And people with prosopagnosia, um, they can experience faces very differently. Um, so for some patients, they might see a, a, like a blurred image, uh, kind of like this, where, when they look at other people. Um, for others, they might perceive like a kind of uh, overlapping uh, collection of details, so overlapping sort of parts of the face. Um, but either way, there's an inability to identify who the person is. And they'd often navigate their social world by using certain clues. So they'd look at people's hairstyle, their, their clothing, uh, wait for them to speak in order to, to understand who they are. 
Now, we're on a little bit of a technical point here. And whether face and object recognition actually involve the same or distinct systems isn't actually clear from a lot of the evidence that, that we've presented so far. And, and there are sort of two possible theories about how face and object perception systems are, are organized in the brain. The first theory is this idea that face perception relies on a sort of separate, specialized system distinct from object perception. And the second theory is that there is just a single object recognition system that's capable of processing varying levels of, of complexity. So at the most simple level, you would have a system that deals with um, processing shapes, simple objects, and then faces represent what we process at, at the sort of higher end of that level. And you could make the argument that individuals with prosopagnosia, uh, you could explain that as either knocking out this face area in theory one on the left-hand side, or it could be the fact that, do you know what, maybe it leads to a general impairment of this uh, overall facial visual recognition system that leaves intact the object recognition, uh, but means that you can't do the more sort of complex uh, face recognition tasks. And most piece of, pieces of evidence point towards the idea that the sort of first theory seems to be the one that, that, that is most likely to be correct. And one example of evidence in, in support of this is the existence of people like patient CK. So this is someone who has intact face perception with impaired object recognition. So CK is someone who would struggle to recognize if you present this image here, which is actually a, a painting from an Italian artist called Grisipi Arcimboldo. Um, and if you look at that, most of you would be able to pick out, it's got vegetables, there's like a bucket that's here. Um, for patient CK, he would look at that and would report, it's a mismatch of colors and shapes. Now the crafty thing that Arcimboldo did um, is when you flip these upside down, uh, there's a face that, that's here. Um, and for patient CK, that would immediately pop out at him. It would be like, yes, okay, I'm, I'm looking at a face. And this is interesting because people like CK um, provide what we call a, a double dissociation. Um, so in other words, we have prosopagnosic patients who can do objects but not faces, and then people like patient CK that can do faces but not objects. And this finding is, is compatible with the first theory, that we've got two different systems, um, but doesn't really fit with, with the second theory. Now, that's not the whole argument when it comes to face processing. Um, and something we don't have time to go into today, but is a, is a kind of big uh, debate in, in psychology, um, over whether the FFA, so the fusiform face area, is actually specialized for faces, or whether it's involved in more kind of fine-grained discrimination of objects, um, and particularly within like an area of expertise. So for example, you find when bird watchers think about different species of birds, you get activation in this fusiform face area. When people that really care about um, model toys, when they're doing discriminations between particular brands and, and models of cars, the fusiform face area gets activated. And also when you train people to recognize these things in the bottom right, uh, which are called greebles, um, when you train people to learn these, that are meant to kind of mimic the complexity of faces, this also activates the fusiform face area. And the argument here is that you know, what the fusiform face area might be activated for is maybe not necessarily faces, but maybe anything that we have expertise for and we need to do some sort of fine grain uh, discrimination ability. Which way the evidence points more strongly? Uh, you will have to come and take a course and find out. The final topic that we're going to address, and one we, again, don't have time to fully go into, but I think you'll probably find interesting, is trying to understand what sorts of inferences do you make about other people based on their faces. So again, this is something that you're doing every day and automatically. So within milliseconds of meeting someone, we tend to use their facial features to guess what it is that they're like. 
So whether we think they're kind looking or, or mean, uh, etc. And we often use these sorts of facial inferences to guide our social interactions. So for instance, if you went to a, a party and across the room you see these two people here, you might be more inclined to approach the woman that's on the left uh, as opposed to the person on the right, simply for the fact that this is a computer-generated image that has all of the properties of extroversion on the left-hand side. So in other words, you, you think the person on the left is going to be more extroverted, more welcoming, um, and that inference is leading you to be more likely to go over and interact with them, despite knowing nothing about their actual personalities. And this has some important applied consequences. So for example, in one of the, the kind of most famous studies in this area, Alexander Todorov and colleagues examined um, the relationship between how competent people thought politicians looked and how successful that politician was in an upcoming election. And you find that people are more likely to vote for people that look more competent, irrespective of their actual competence, which in some way kind of sends a, a depressing message that it's sort of better to look competent than it is to, to be competent. Okay, now before we finish, I'm going to return to the suspicious guy on the roof, and we're going to find out who it is. Um, first of all, I'm just ignoring who you think the actual suspect was. I want your input on how confident are you about your judgments. So again, we're going from that scale, zero, absolutely no idea, to 100 is I'm certain. Can you raise your hand? I'm not going to pick out anybody, so feel free to raise your hand without fear of being singled out. Um, raise your hand if you have like zero uh, confidence in your judgment. Okay, a few of you, not many. Um, what if you were between zero and 50? Okay, a few more of you. Uh, 60. 70. 80. Okay, 90 or 100. Okay, there's at least like 10, 15 of you that are absolutely certain you've got the person. Um, for the last thing we're going to do today, can you just stand up? And we're going to, uh, yeah, stand up. I'm going to run through your guesses. Sorry, Victor, you can stay sitting. It's okay. If you thought it was four, can you sit down? Okay, if you thought it was two, you can sit down. If you thought it was three, you can sit down. If you thought it was five, you can sit down. If you thought it was one, you can sit down. Okay, there's a lot of you still standing. If you thought it was six, you can sit down. So there's a few of you still standing up here. Maybe some of you have seen this one before. Um, the answer is that the suspect uh, was not in that lineup. <laughs> so these. So these were all just. Congratulations for those of you that, uh, that were confident in doing this. Um, so these were just all normal, innocent men. And I think for me, the thing that is really interesting here is the level of confidence that some of you would have had in your decisions. So despite knowing that the guilty party wasn't in there, there was a, a significant proportion of people in this room that would have stood up in a court of law and said, do you know what, I'm absolutely certain. I, I'm really confident in my choice. I don't think I've got this wrong. Um, as hopefully that example illustrated to you, 
Our ability to kind of memorize and recognize unfamiliar faces is incredibly fragile. Um, so I showed you the suspect lineup immediately after you saw the, uh, the suspicious person. So there wasn't even time to like have your memory degrade. But one of the things that we end up doing is, is placing a lot of weight on eyewitness testimony. So if you're in court and, and a witness says that, do you know what, I saw suspect number six, uh, they were on the roof, they were holding uh, something suspicious, and they're absolutely sure of it, that is really damning evidence a lot of the time. Um, but we know that people can easily get it wrong. And they get it so wrong that data from the US shows that around 70% of wrongful convictions are based on false eyewitness testimony. So these are cases where somebody has been exonerated from DNA evidence, um, but the leading evidence in their original trial would have come from a, an eyewitness uh, who must have been incorrect. Um, so this is one area where we get interesting applications of, of psychology where you can realize that we can identify where these biases occur and do something about them. So you can make structural changes to things like the police lineup. So in the example you had, there was a sequential lineup where you saw all of the people together. Uh, we now know that doing those are, are a bad idea and what you should get is suspects that are presented to you um, independently, individually, for you to make your, your judgments. So these are the sorts of areas where psychology can uh, have some good applied impacts. Um, thank you so much for your attention today. I hope you have a great day at the rest of the convention. Uh, yeah, thanks again for your time. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Harry Manley. I feel we've all learned a little something about social psych today. We've all, all right, ladies and gentlemen, please. Hmm? Oh, my bad, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please raise your hands if you fell for Dr. Manley's trick just now. Samoa kanakon, abisla. Don't worry, don't worry. Don't worry. Uh, as a per personal experience, as a year three student, you, the entire class fell for this trick as well. Relax. Everyone is the same. Everyone is the same. Okay? Right. And, hmm, okay, give me a moment. Yeah, okay. Raise your hand if you jotted down a lot of notes just now. Okay, how many of you guys actually took pictures on your phones and stuff? Uh, ah, see, Okay, sorry, Gen Z, Gen Z, Gen Z, Gen Z. Gen Z. my bad, my bad, my yeah. bad. Okay, but then did you all enjoy the lectures? Yeah. yeah, that's good. Did you learn something to impress your boyfriend or girlfriend? Yeah. <laughs> oh. You can find one in help, bro. <laughs> you didn't hear from us though. <laughs> Sorry, I cannot guarantee, uh, not guarantee. Uh, probability. <laughs> Need to see your face. <laughs> joking, joking, joking. Okay, okay. So, that is the end of the keynote lectures. That is the end of the keynote lectures. I'm sorry, bro. Don't worry. I don't have a sir. That's the end of our keynote lectures. And we hope that you have learned something from these lectures that you can use both in your, in your daily life and also for yourself. Understand yourself a little bit better. Oh, there you go. Yeah, understand yourself a little bit better and also about the things that happen all around you. That's, how, that's what psychology is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And hopefully it will also help you in the psych challenge later as well. Oh yeah, speaking of help. Speaking of help. Well, just to shamelessly plug here for a second. Oh, no. <laughs> if this intrigues you and you would like to know, learn more about the field of psychology and also about help, we can help you with that. Feel free to check out the CMD, which is the Customer Marketing Department in the Student Lounge to find out more about the psychology programs that we offer here in HELP. If you don't know where um, the Student Lounge is, if you don't know where uh, CMD is, feel free to ask our facilitators that are wearing the HELP University Department t-shirts. Mm -hmm. HELP, yeah. univers HELP University facilitators, you can raise your hands over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah people like them, okay? Yeah, They'll the be black walk shirts. Yep, they're walking around the campus all around to help you. They okay? kind of look a little bit dead inside, so yes. just gotta like tap them on the shoulder. Okay so, once, okay, so once again, if you want to know more about psychology, CMD is the place to be to find everything you need about psychology, scholarships or lecturers to meet. And um, a wonderful program for you and me. Um, that was a terribly shameless plug. Well, are we even getting paid enough to plug like this? Wait, you're getting paid? And 
Anyway, so we're moving on to our psych challenge shortly. So if you sign up for the challenge, please stay in this hall. I repeat, stay in this hall if you are taking part in the psych challenge because very soon we will be having a briefing by a uh, Shopee version Professor X. Sitting over there. <laughs> young version, young version, still got hair. Yes. And for the rest of you who are not participating, uh, who are not looking to participate in the Psych Challenge, the convention is now open for you to explore. Also, important note, important note for all of you, to the students who came here by bus, to the students who came here by bus, please wait inside CLTG later when you are going to leave, okay? Please wait inside CLTG when your bus is coming to uh, unfortunately take you away from this place. Yeah. Right? So please feel free to leave the hall and we will see you for the closing ceremony at 4 p.m. Closing ceremony at 4 p.m. Come back so, here. Uh, make sure you all come back here, okay? We will miss oh, you, miss one, okay? You. Have fun, okay? Right, bye, bye. You bye bye. Bye bye. Oh, our children growing up already. Uh, they're going old already. They're, <laughs> they're leaving already. <laughs> Okay, but okay, seriously, those who are not in the house, I got Bye bye, please get enjoy out. the convention. Get out, go enjoy the booth. They Don't work tell very them hard. to get out, lah. What? Sometimes you have to use some force, you so know. So rude. Parent A, positive parenting, okay? Psychology Gen Z likes positive sorry, parenting. Sorry, sorry, I failed 112. <laughs> okay, but those of us the side challenge, stay here, stay here. Remember, stay here. And now a message from our sponsors. Be a part of the number one psychology program in Malaysia. Help University. Immerse yourself in the world of mind and brain studies. Psychology. Grab your brochure from the booths outside the hall. Look for CMD. Okay, enough plugging. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah enough, 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 enough. Cannot hear you yeah, also. Yeah. Yeah. You're not even listening. Uh, I know, right? I uh, get paid for what? Okay. Enjoy the convention, everybody. Take have care. Fun, we'll see fun. you all again. Bye bye. bye. Try, you're going to go home. At least. All right, so the remaining students here in the hall, I'm getting it that you guys are taking part in the side challenge, right? Right, 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 right. Give me nods of approval, huh? No? Yes? Thank you. Okay, all right. So um, please take your seats because we will have the briefing. So um, if you have any questions, you can ask us shortly, but we will have, need to have the briefing right now. So please take your seats. Take your seats. Yes. Ade ade, sila duduk. Sila duduk. Sila duduk. Sit down. Sing ni zuo xia, zuo yi xia. Guys, please take your seats. We will start shortly. Forward. Nak pergi tandas. Ajen ah, ajen ah. Number one or number two? Number one, number two. Yeah, yeah, I did it, but some of them... No, they went to the toilet. Okay, we have to wait. 
I think someone.